How's it going? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear perfect. Great. How's good, it going? Great. great to great to uh, meet you. Nice to meet you too. You have a microphone. I just got myself one, and this was supposed to be like the first time I use it, and I didn't manage to get it to work. So there you go. <laughs> it it takes a second, but I I think it is worth it. Hopefully, you can tell mm. a little bit the the audio quality is like you know a hair better than than I, I have these Bluetooth headphones in too. But it's really hard to hear. I have a I have a deep voice, and so uh, when I use these generic microphones, it kind of comes off as just. <laughs> <kinda>. <laughs> It's hard okay. to hear. <laughs> so I invested <laughs> early in this pandemic into a mic that uh, is, yeah. is good. everybody always comments on it though. It's a, it's a yeah, it's <laughs> there you go. <laughs> of discussion. Yeah, um, cool. So how long have you been doing this? Um, about the podcast, the podcast. Th th that, <laughs> that's actually not that long. We, we started with um, smart branding <clears throat> as um sort of a complementary thing to what we're doing with Mark Upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, so it's for educating our audience or anybody who wants to learn more about branding, naming, and domain names. And then we, we, yeah, we were doing the interviews and a lot of people started asking for doing them in video because it's, uh, I guess it's easier. It's a free conversation. It probably takes less than if you have to sit and write something. Um, so yeah, I'm not some like super experienced interviewer myself. So, and <laughs> as you can see, I'm just like starting to, uh, invest in, in, well, getting the microphone <laughs> and headphones <laughs> that go with it, but they didn't work. So uh, let's hope yeah. you're going to be the last person I'm interviewing without a microphone. <laughs> oh, good. Good. I, I like to, to make history that way. So yeah, that's good. Um... <laughs> that's good. <laughs> So uh, I, you know, I, I, you know, have some preliminary maybe caveats to to the comments that I can give today, but uh, happy to let you sort of take it away and and you know ask whatever questions that that you have. So so maybe I'll just start very quickly just about the, the little caveats that I have. So I'm an attorney. I'm in the United States. Uh, I practice trademark, copyright, advertising law. Um, you know. Anything I say really today are just general comments about this area of the law. Um, so anyone who listens to this later, or, you know, downloads the transcript or whatever the case may be, you should know that uh, this area of the law is incredibly subjective. Uh, you should always speak to an attorney about your specific fact pattern. Uh, I have to say that, you know, unless we've engaged in engagement letter, you know, I'm not your attorney. We don't have any sort of attorney client relationship. I'm just here today on the podcast sharing sort of general comments and thoughts about branding. Um, I'm obviously coming at this from a U.S. perspective. The, I think there's a lot of, uh, I think a lot of the principles that would apply in the U.S. likely apply outside of the U.S. too in many ways, but you should never assume that, you know, the, the law in one jurisdiction is going to be the same in another jurisdiction. So just, you know, to be clear from a, <laughs> from a legal <laughs> front, I'm just, uh, just chatting today. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I'm kind of imagining you now having to do that anywhere you go with your job. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, to... <laughs> I should have like a little card maybe and I could just yeah, like hold just, it up to the screen. Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's good. So that, okay, that's all. Uh, with that out of the way, go, go for it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been doing some um, coaching lately for, um, speaking and um, all those sorts of things and um, I like very much uh, today I was listening to um, one course and they were saying you should always try to explain things as if you're talking to like a three-year-old and reason being that and and I caught myself I was like I do that all the time because when you're passionate about something and you know your topic you get into a conversation and you start like talking about it and and you completely forget that the person on the other side may have zero idea like their level of uh, knowledge and understanding on that topic is probably not yours likely not yours um, so I, I wanted to start with like if you can tell me as if you're explaining it to a three-year-old what do you do yeah. 
Um, sure. And uh, that's actually pretty easy for me because I have a three-year-old, so I spend most okay. of my day talking <laughs> Uh, in those terms, <laughs> no. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, uh, no. So what? What I do? Uh, so like I said, I, I, I'm an attorney, and I basically have two different fronts that I deal with. I deal with the prosecution side of things, and I deal with the litigation side of things. Uh, which I know prosecution sounds like it's a uh, litigious term, but it's really not in this industry. It's maybe a, a more apt word would be corporate. So mm -hmm. about half my day, I spend um, clearing brands. So a brand team will come to me with, I have five choices or 10 choices of, of different things that we want to call this new product, or we have a new tagline that we want to launch, you know, which one's the, the most risk, you know, less risk adverse or most risk adverse option. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick, we'll, we'll maybe pick a handful of those. We'll run clearance searches on them. So I'm looking to see what other rights are out there in, in the space. And then uh, assuming we get comfortable with a brand or a tagline, I'll take that and I'll file a trademark application for it to get protection. And then I'll push that trademark through, hopefully to eventually obtain a registration. Um, that, you know, that's on the trademark side, copyright side, very similar. Um, and advertising side, also very similar. You know, I'm looking at maybe a video and maybe there's a third party brand in the background or something. And, you know, what's our mm. risk look like? Um, so that's half my day. And then the other half um, of, of the time I spend is litigating. And so, you know, maybe we already have a registration <laughs> and we're going out and we're sending a party a demand letter because they've adopted something that's too close to our name or we've received the demand letter and I'm responding or I'm in court, you know, fighting for uh, for trademark uh, rights, uh, filing motions, attending hearings, things like that. Um, so that's basically my breakdown. That's a very high level of it. Um, I think you know maybe I should have started and backed backed up to say that uh, there are when people hear. So I do intellectual property law, and, and when people hear, oh, you do IP law people use the terms very interchangeably, though they are not interchangeable in terms of the different buckets of goods, that, okay. uh, of categories you have. So you've got copyrights is a very distinct area of the law, separate and apart from trademarks, which is a very distinct area of the law, separate and apart from patents, which is a very distinct area of the law. Um, in, you know, in, in a copyright realm, you know, we're worried about original works of authorship. We want to encourage people to create content. Um, and uh, you know, that the, the protections that, that attach to that and the process for that is different. You know, in the United States, there's the United States Copyright Office. It's completely different from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. The process for getting a copyright registration is different and the laws that govern it are completely different. Um, patent law, you know, we're worried about protecting novel inventions. We want, you know, people to create new things that are going to benefit society. And we want to carve out, you know, mini monopolies for them to be able to to sell whatever products they've been able to patent for X period of time, um, which is different than trademarks. Uh, and I don't do the patent stuff. So I, I'm not a patent mm -hmm. attorney. I only do the copyrights and the trademarks. And then the trademarks, the last bucket, that's, you know, you encounter trademarks every day. Um, those, are, those are the brands <laughs> that, that you see around mm -hmm. you. They are source identifiers for particular goods in services. Um, so you know that when you go to the store, you know, we're in that in trademarks, we're worried about protecting. Well, there's different theories, but the, a, a prevailing theory is that we're worried about protecting the public. We're worried about protecting consumers. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's value in knowing that when you go to the store, Pepsi is going to taste like Pepsi. The same bottle that you buy here is going to taste like the same bottle that you bought in a vending machine. It's a consistent quality that you can know and expect. Um, and there's value in that. And if somebody comes along and, and they make a, a Pepsi product that's not genuine Pepsi, it doesn't emanate from the Pepsi company, then that's a problem because then you're not going to get that consistent result. And so we want to protect the consumers from being confused about the affiliation or sponsorship or endorsement of, of the real Pepsi company to that product. Um, mm. So that's, that's the, maybe that last part was, was too much for what, uh, my three-year-old might, might be able to handle, but, <laughs> but the beginning part wasn't, I, I think, you know, high, 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 the, high level. No, there. I liked yeah. it. Uh, no, I, I like, actually, 
literally the last last part as you were saying it i'm like oh i haven't thought about it that way because when people talk about trademarks copyrights we often have that image of um like the, those evil corporations that want to make more money and the way you're putting it is no it's to protect the customer and that's a something that is very different you, you like oh yeah that that makes sense that's a good thing and i yeah, mean you're it, using the pepsi example but it can be anything like it can be medications or like toys that your kids play with and and yeah that's a very different perspective yes and in fact the the legal standard for trademark infringement is a quote unquote likelihood of consumer confusion mm -hmm. that's the that's the test. And of course, only lawyers could come up with that test because it's so subjective. <laughs> um, but what, what that means, you know, there's different factors that a court could look at, but what they're looking at is, uh, you know, visual similarities between the, the trademarks. They're looking at, are the goods and services overlapping? Are they similar? Are they related in some way? Uh, and are the target consumers the same? There's different factors that court can look at anything, but generally if you're checking those three boxes, same target consumers, same goods and services, visually similar, phonetically similar trademarks, you're, you're running into the, to the realm of trademark infringement. And that's because if you do those three things, most of the time, you're going to have uh, a likelihood of consumer confusion. You're going to cause consumers mm -hmm. to be confused. It's going to hurt consumers in the marketplace and, and you can't hurt consumers. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a three, three years old can get that. You can't hurt consumers. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's it. That's all you need to know. I mean, case pleasant. I've got I've got books on trademark law behind me that I could have summed it up in like one yeah. line, and we'd have been done. <laughs> uh, cool stuff. All right. Um, so um, when we're talking, because I, I'm on the naming, uh, branding, and domain name side of it, mm -hmm. and with the domain names of from where i stand i what i see often is um businesses or business owners come to think about domain names usually i often get asked like what's the biggest mistake when it comes to domain names and and i mean i can probably make a list but the one i would say is most common is not thinking about it early enough um <clears throat> and I guess my question is, when is the right time to think about trademarks and copyrights? And usually when people come up with ideas or start a business, I don't think many, at least small to medium businesses, think about those things initially. So when is the right time? Yeah, immediately, really, because the sooner the better. Trademark law, just like it's a property law. So like other property law, <laughs> um, first in time, first in right. That's a just general principle. Uh, so if you go to the grocery store, customers will just sort of ordinarily form a straight line, right? You know, the person in front of you is ahead of you, the person behind you is behind you. Trademark law is exactly the same way. So somebody who is ahead of you, they're first in time, they are first in right, they're going to check out before you. Um, they have better rights. Um, same with trademarks. Uh, so you want to think about it early in the process because you can file a trademark application that could put you earlier in the line. Yeah, that's like having your maybe my three-year-old to go stand in line to stand there. <laughs> I'm gonna go get milk. <laughs> I've reserved my spot. <laughs> I've reserved my spot in line. She's too little to do that, but, I, but you get the idea. You could have somebody uh, stand in line. Yeah. And, and, and that is fine. That's sort of the equivalent of filing a trademark application. You may not have launched the business yet, but you have a good faith basis that you're going to be checking out soon. That you're going to be in business soon, and so you want to reserve that spot. Um. So you should think about it early. I see. The mistake that I see quite often is that people will they'll do two things. They'll form a company, they'll, they'll register their company with the state, and they'll go to a place like Google Domains. They'll look for a .com variation because everybody still wants it, um, and they'll register a .com <coughs> name. So they'll register the .com name, they'll get social media for, the, for, for that name, and they'll register with the state, and they'll think, I'm all set, good to go. And that is where they're dead wrong, <laughs> because that does not give you trademark rights. Registering the business under the name does not give you trademark rights. I think a lot of people find that confusing. Uh, registering a domain name does not give you trademark rights. What gives you trademark rights is filing a trademark application with your relevant jurisdiction, or, and, and at least in the United States, selling goods and services under the trademark. 
that's how you get trademark mm. rights is you have to be engaged in commerce. So if you're not selling goods and services right now and you don't have a trademark application, just because you registered XYZ.com and just because you formed XYZ Inc. does not mean you own XYZ. Somebody mm. else could launch after you, after you incorporated and have better rights in the name. And mm. in fact, could even see, could even prevent you from using that dot com domain. Um, so uh, that's the mistake that I see quite often. <laughs> and, and it's sort of an understandable mistake because you think I've done all those things with my brand. Like I don't understand. Mm. I, I, I got the dot com like I was supposed to. I did all this stuff. But if you're not, uh, if you're not filing a trademark application and you're not selling goods and services under the mark, then you are not gaining trademark rights. Uh, so that's point one. And so what should you do? The first thing you should do really is clear the name, pick a name, you know, conceive one in concept, uh, run a clearance for it to see if it's available, check to see if the .com domain name is available. And if it is, you know, one that you could register for like 12 bucks a year or something, I'd just snag that immediately. Um, if not, then you want to consider, can you acquire that domain name? Um, you know, can you buy it from somebody else? Um, but before you even start that process, you'd be better off seeking protection for the trademark. Because I have had situations where people spent a lot of money on a domain name, six plus figures, and only to find out that it conflicts with another brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think I have, a, I have a question on that actually. Because obviously we get that very often because you have like generic dictionary words, then you have descriptive words. Um, like I'm, I'm very close to the level of your three year old on that. So for example, like Apple can have, it has a trademark on computers and phones, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of things. I've but never if, heard of it. If they were, <laughs> no, <laughs> if, you know that brand. Apple. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> but um, they would not be able to do that if they were to sell like literal apples. Am I correct? Yeah. You, yes, you are. Yes, you are correct with that. <laughs> um, so I, and I can explain that a little bit too and exactly how that works. Um, so, you know, take you on a little ride called the spectrum of distinctiveness. And I didn't make hey. this up. This is something that just exists. <laughs> Um, and again, only lawyers would come up with this, but this is how this is, this is the law. Um, and so all trademarks will sit somewhere on a spectrum of what's called distinctiveness, which is just, uh, really how unique the name is in relation to the goods or services that you sell. Mm -hmm. Um, so all trademark rights as a, just a general matter, tie only to specific goods and services that you could get to a point where your mark is famous and maybe it ties into other goods and services that you don't sell because it's famous. Um, but that's very few brands that fall into that category. It's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other <laughs> podcast, you know, for this, for, for purposes of this, you know, let's stick to the basics. The, uh, your trademark is falling somewhere on the spectrum of distinctiveness and it's only in relation to the goods and services that you sell. So the different categories that are on the spectrum are uh, generic trademarks. And that would be like the, the one that you had picked out Apple in connection with the sale of apples. Um, mm -hmm. You sell apples, it's generic for what you're doing. It's not a source, you know, it doesn't function as a source identifier when consumers, so we're going back to consumers, when consumers see Apple, they, in connection with the sale of apples, they're thinking about the product, <laughs> not the brand. Um, that those trademarks are generally never protectable. You don't get trademark rights for generic marks. You can't, it's not fair that you could stop competitors from calling their thing what it is. Mm -hmm. um, the second category is called merely descriptive trademarks. And that might be running with your Apple example, uh, apple juice in connection with the sale of juice. It's not generic uh, because it's not the, the genre of what it is that you're selling, but it describes immediately a quality characteristic or feature of the good. It's mm -hmm. apple flavored juice. Mm -hmm. um, those trademarks also are not inherently distinctive. They fall on the wrong side of that spectrum of distinctiveness line. So they also are not generally protectable absent a showing of secondary meaning. And so what that means is if you have been substantially exclusively selling apple juice 
under the name apple juice uh, for a period of generally five or more years in the U.S., you would be entitled to uh, a, a showing of acquired distinctiveness, which means that you've been using it because you've been you basically you've been using it for so long now. Consumers have stopped seeing it as that descriptive term and have started to see mm. it as a brand for for the good or service mm -hmm. that you sell. Okay. That those are tough, and then you end up with kind of weak rights at the end of the day because you you know somebody can still generically refer to their product as you know the flavor of the juice is apple, so mm -hmm. um, you're never going to be able to get a gag order on something like that. Um, okay, that's the wrong side of the line. Now the better side of the spectrum of distinctiveness. The first category is a suggestive trademark. And running with your apple example, I'll say. Uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away in connection with vitamins. That mm. would be a suggestive mark because it's a popular kids, or I don't know what do you, what do you want to call that, but it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a popular little saying that people say, and it evokes imagery of medicine and doctors. It, mm -hmm. but it requires a mental leap to get there, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like apple juice where it's immediately describing the quality. Apple a day keeps the doctor away. You got to think about it for a, a second and then you get to vitamins. That's a suggestive trademark. That's going to be protectable as a trademark inherently. You don't have to show anything else. The final category is the one that you had mentioned, Apple in connection with the sale of computers. That's an arbitrary trademark. It's arbitrary because it's a real word that has no meaning in connection with the goods or services other than the brand equity that you build up. You only associate it with computers and phones now because Apple did a really good job of marketing and educating consumers about their brand. Um, those are the stronger marks. The, you want to be for the further you are, the, 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 the further you are down this line of spectrum of distinctiveness, the better mm -hmm. um, from a trademark perspective. Uh, the other category that I would say arbitrary slash fanciful, and that a fanciful term is one that is not a real dictionary word. Um, it is uh, like Google or Bluetooth is something that, you know, entirely made up. It, it's, it's only mm -hmm. function is to be a trademark. Um, mm -hmm. so those are actually even a little better than an arbitrary trademark because they didn't exist prior to you. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it means nothing other than mm -hmm. your brand. Um, so the further you can go down that spectrum of distinctiveness, the better from a branding standpoint and where I would push and do push a lot of the startups that I work with is, you know, go early, develop equity in the brand. You know, you'll be better off in the long run. You'll spend less on trademarks in the long run. And you'll have bigger, broader rights. You can fence off more rights if you have a fanciful trademark, because you know you can. You, there's no need for your competitor to to use anything close to what to mm -hmm. what you have. So that's where I would do it. Having said that, let me see. I know I've been talking for a minute, but one other tidbit: if you're a startup, um, I'm not going to completely knock merely descriptive trademarks because there is value immediately. It's, it's sort of a long-term versus a short-term benefit. Mm -hmm. The better long-term business plan is to pick a distinctive trademark, one far on this end of the spectrum, um, because that's going to give you the biggest rights in the long run. There is a short-term benefit, though, to that descriptive trademark, because it immediately, you don't have to educate your consumers as much. Mm -hmm. if, you, you know, if your product's called X1Y, XYZZZ, <laughs> something yeah. crazy, um, you're going to have to do a lot of explaining <laughs> to, to what, <laughs> what that means. Like it's going to take a lot of advertising. Whereas if you, your thing is apple juice and you sell apple juice, it's not, not going to require a whole lot of, yeah. of mental exercise to get there. Um, it's good in the short run. So it'll help you get off the ground quicker, but it's going to create problems for you down the line because you're not going to be able to fence that off likely. And you're going to have a hell of a time enforcing it. And you may even run into the trouble of, third parties coming after you where, you know, they think that they've got exclusive rights in, in that term and you're too close to them. And so now you're dealing with an infringement case. And, uh, mm -hmm. It's so <clears throat> it's, it's, it's more sticky long-term. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And on that, um, I, I saw on your website, you deal with, um, Advertising, and that was something I haven't thought about, I guess, because it's not really directly related to what I do, but um, there was an example of uh, Black Falls advertising, and you mentioned earlier in your introduction as well that uh, like you would be looking at a video if there's uh, some brand mentioned, etc. So that, like if I imagine from where I stand 
um, in my experience with branding and naming. So like somebody would come up with an idea, then you come up with uh, names, then you go into domain names. So discussing some different, like you go to designers da, da, da. and then the ongoing um, process of, of, of marketing in the company. And if I think about like, yeah, running an advert or just the day-to-day -day activities, marketing and sales activities in a company, at what point, like what's the, what's the red light or at, at what point should a business owner say that I need to run it by, uh, yeah, by a company like yours before it goes out? Really, ideally, again, it's another one where it's like, ugh, ideally, like all of them, because there's oh. so many, there's so many ways that could go wrong. I mean, at, at a minimum, you know, if you're just starting out, you probably want to do an initial consult with uh, an attorney just to get your feet wet in terms of, and maybe have them look at like one or two of what you're doing. And then, you know, maybe if you're, if you have a higher risk appetite or you just don't have the budget, maybe you say like, I'll, I'll uh, you know, just go with what I've got basically and, and try to stay mm. within the, the right side of the line. Um, but there's so many things that could, you know, it's, it's, it, that's a very fact specific scenario where, you know, tiny differences in the ad could make you fall on different sides of the line here. But again, if you're looking for like a general rule of thumb, you know, we're worried about consumers again. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you can't say anything that's false or misleading. Uh, and maybe that key emphasis on misleading every, a lot of people know what false is, but um, maybe a lot of people, there's a little more wiggle room in terms of what's misleading. You know, Pepsi couldn't say, if you drink Coke, it'll turn your hair blue. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, assuming it doesn't actually turn your hair blue, it's, you know, that's obviously false. Um, but, you know, what if they said something, you know, closer to, what if they suggested that it might turn your hair blue? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, they they ran an ad with people drinking Coca Cola cans and all their hair were blue. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, you, they did something that might mislead consumers about a, a, a fact, a material fact, something that might affect their purchasing decision. That would be false advertising. Um, and so I guess you'd want to take a step back and try to try to be objective and look at your own advertisement and say. Is there anything about this that is literally false? Um, and if not, is there anything about it that suggests a fact that is false um, mm. that might trick some of my consumers into thinking something? And it's not necessarily about a competitor either. It could be about your own product. You know, mm. uh, drinking Pepsi will give you a six pack. You know, <laughs> no, <Yeah>. it won't. <laughs> yeah, I would already have one if that were true. No. I, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, um, you, so you have to be you're not, you're not only careful about external brands, you got to be careful about what you're saying about your own brand, too, and the representations mm. you're making to, to customers. Um, and it can be hard to do that sometimes. Um, you want to take a, that's, that's sort of the benefit of having counsel on those types of ads, um, because they're also an independent third party who doesn't have that emotional connection to your product that you likely do. If you're a startup, you're probably passionate mm. about what you're doing. Uh, and you, you may not be as objective as, as, mm -hmm. as you think you are about your, your product. Um, and if you're going to say something about your product that it does X or does Y, then you really ought to be able to quantifiably back it up. You know, um, you, you want to, to be able to support those statements. You can't make claims that you know, your product is, you know, kills a hundred percent of germs. Well, did you do a study on it? Like what study mm -hmm. did you do? Does it actually kill a hundred percent? Is it, you know, only a hundred percent of this type of germ, but really the, you know, whatever it is, right. You've got to, you have to be careful. <laughs> you have thinking, to be careful. If you, if you're thinking like that all the time, it must be very hard being you watching ads. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I can't, I can't even watch the Super Bowl. I turn on all the lights in <laughs> my house and close my eyes. Uh, no, I do. I do. I, and it's, it is fun too seeing some of the ads that you've worked on and, and some of the brands that you've worked on and you see something come out and you're like, oh, uh, that could have been X. You can't say it because uh, mm -hmm. it's all attorney client privilege, but you know, I sort of chuckle and think to myself like, <laughs> that, <could've> been, <laughs> that was almost Z <laughs> instead of X. Um, that's a lot of fun. So it does, yeah, sounds like it. So it does very much because in my head there was already like a little war in every um, 
the, the bigger the companies, I guess the, the more complex it gets because you have, you know, the people who come up with the ideas, then you have the uh, the designers who go, oh, we can do this, we can do that. And then you have the more technical side of go, no, we can't do that. So that's how you do it. And, and now you, you just like added that um, perspective that I'm like, oh, okay, so now there's another somebody we need to ask. It almost makes me think like, I don't know if it's a done thing, but it probably is not a bad idea. Like if if in a company you could have some sort of a, um, even initially some crash course on the do's and don'ts on the legal side for everybody, because literally like a designer, a programmer, they don't even think in those terms. And yeah. that would be really helpful. Yeah, I do actually some trainings on, on that. So, uh, and I've, yeah, I've done that a number of times where, Usually I'm talking to either a marketing team or an in-house legal team. So a lot of the bigger companies have attorneys, you know, that work for the company that will be reviewing content mm-hmm. um, because they do, as, as you point out, you're, you know, as you're sitting there realizing that like, oh, man, I, I'm basically getting everything run through legal and checking. And mm. yeah, that's, that's kind of <laughs> what has to happen. That's, that's why, that's why a lot of these large companies have teams of attorneys who are just doing that, sifting through the content and making sure that it's okay, clearing the brands and making sure that it's okay. Um, and even those attorneys, um, you know, I'll sit down and do, you know, maybe like an annual, like reminder, here's a crash course on, this is what trademarks are. This is what you're looking for in advertising. These are the new cases that came out. Be careful here. Be careful about rights of publicity. You know, make sure you're getting releases from, from, from everybody. And, and, and a lot of people want to use um, uh, third-party content like, uh, mm. you know, videos from a social media platform or something um, of, of different users. And there's all sorts of nightmares there because, mm. you know, they're generally things that are just happening live, right, with, with whatever the user is they're they're not thinking about getting releases for the person who was across the room in that funny video or they're not worried about that there was this brand in the background that was showing um mm. they're not worried about the music that might be playing uh over <laughs> over top as the as they're yeah. creating that video so there's just all sorts of yeah but to, so to back it up yes uh you, <laughs> Yeah, you, a training session can go a, a really long way. Um, and then for team for for companies that don't have you know that aren't quite as large and don't have that in house lawyer or team of lawyers, um, I've I've also talked to them. It's a different presentation. It's you know more of the three year old version of <laughs> of of the the status of the law and just sort of hitting the broad broad topics. You know, like uh, you can't just go to Google Images and take that stuff and put it on yeah. your website. <laughs> Like that's a no, no, um, you know, things like that, but they're, they're tremendously helpful because, you know, it, it really is one of those areas of the law where an ounce of medicine is worth a pound of cure. Hmm. Yeah. No, For I sure. can absolutely see that. I mean, even just getting people to think in that direction and then asking themselves questions as they work on something, is already a huge difference as opposed to, yeah, I can take that image because it's on Google. Yeah. Right. So yeah so you mentioned on your website i've done my homework going through your website obviously um your brand is one of your most valuable and essential assets which i completely agree with and i think it's even more uh, present now than than i guess ever before um and now especially with the pandemic that uh, we have uh, digital acceleration everybody's talking about everybody's online um and I'm going to obviously ask you about domain names. How and where do you see domain names as part of that uh, brand? Uh, yeah, I see it declining if I'm going to be you know, level with you. I, I'd be, when you say domain names, I, I'm really thinking of the, like the, the, the big dot com domain names. I see that and I've seen that declining a little bit year after year. Um, I think that the brands are obviously important. But the reason why the dot coms are a little less important now, and I think you saw like a few years ago, you saw the burst of uh, dot IOs because a lot of tech companies liked it because, it, you know, IO is short for input output, mm-hmm. even though it's obviously Indonesia. Yeah. Um, um, but so, and, and, and they could get short domains for mm-hmm. what they were looking for. So you get a, like a four letter dictionary word domain for 60 bucks um, a year if it's a .io. 
And so a lot of companies flock to that. But at any rate, I got, I got off track. Where, where I see the change happening is that 10, 20 years ago, if you wanted hotels, what you might have done is you might have typed into a, a search engine or, or to a web browser, hotels.com and hoping that you would find somebody who offers something about hotels. That was kind of how you found goods or services in the early age of um, the internet as a marketplace. Um, but as time has gone on, I would say that most people, even when they type it into the search bar, they're actually running a, a, an internet query. They're running it on Google or the five people who use Bing or <laughs> um, <laughs> DuckDuckGo or, or whoever else, you know, uh, whatever it is that you're using, you're, you're typing it into a browser likely. And that browser is likely running an internet search for the thing that it is that you're looking for. So no long, I, I, I'm sure there still are some people who type in hotels.com, but I would venture to guess the vast majority of people who are looking for hotels search hotels as an internet search term on like Google and then they see the top hits. Um, and then they click the one that's been curated for them. And that may or may not be a domain name that has the word hotel in it. It could be a completely distinctive name. It doesn't have to be short. It doesn't have to be a dictionary word. What matters is getting ranked higher on page one or two, really page one of internet search results. Um, so as a result of that, I see the domain, the value of your dictionaryword.com domain names is decreasing because the whole point was is that it drove traffic. It drove traffic to the website because people were typing it in because they were looking for that particular good or service. They're not doing that anymore. Now it's about where you rank on, on the search. And if you're not ranking high, I don't care what your website's called, it's not worth that much anymore. So as time goes, if that's the way the market continues, and you know the people who are typing in hotels.com start to fade away. Um, I see the dot coms being less and less valuable. That's my that's my take on the on the market direction. Mm. And I've seen that play out. I've, I've seen the you know over the the last few years, I've had less and less interest in spending you know less and less appetite to spend the money on the big dot com domain name. They still do well, it. I still and I still do it. Listen. But but yeah. it's less, it's less than what it was. It's more, it, it's actually more important from a domain name acquisition point as I'm learning, what is your current internet traffic like? Where do you currently rank SEO wise? Um, mm. Cause that's what I want to know. Um, that's, that's more valuable to me than, than what the name is on the, mm. on the dot com end. I think definitely the, the, reasoning and the perspective has changed. Yeah. The, like you said, the, I mean, rarely somebody, um, types in the name and the dot com. It's more, um, I think, as as part of that integral brand image. So, like, if I'm Nike, for example, and I don't have Nike dot com, I am going to be whatever I do. I'm going to be losing emails and traffic and a uh, bunch of other things to and causing that confusion, and then. Uh, I think there was um, an interview recently um, with angel.com, I believe they acquired, and they were saying like, we, we were wondering whether to spend that much money for a domain name. Uh, and then we calculated how much would it cost to get people to remember some alternative of that name, like get angel.com or something like that. So it's, it's more, that and and that's what I say to pretty much everybody I work with when people reach out for a particular domain name, it's it's about what is it worth to you. If if you're just starting out, you don't obviously often <clears throat> times have six figure budget for a domain name, and even if you have a six figure budget and that's all you have, I wouldn't advise you to put it in that domain name. Yeah, that's yeah. one story. Yeah. Yeah. But if you do have the budget and you do have that, you know, really strong vision idea, maybe even a product already, a good domain name that's exactly matching your brand name obviously can, you know, propel you forward and save you. I think you mentioned earlier in the conversation, it's um, the, you mentioned it in, not about domain names, but brand names, but there are certain names that are much easier to just rem be remembered by, by your audience. And that's, that translates into cash, obviously. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I, I mean, uh, and I like the point that you were hitting on too about uh, it's the domain name value is subjective and it's a very unique marketplace uh, because uh, it's, you know, you can really engage in price discrimination um, in terms of the domain. It really does depend on on the buyer. It, it's sort of like real estate, right? Um, you know, it's not unlike that. There's only one of this exact domain at this, you know, top domain name. Um, so if you want it, you can't, there's no alternative. If you're holding the .com, mm. you know, and you want that domain, there is no, there's no substitute other than changing the domain slightly. Um, but if you wanted that exact iteration, there's no substitute good for it. And so it does allow, you know, domain name registrants, registrants to engage in some intense price discrimination at times. If you know that the other side is a very large company, they may be willing and have been willing to drop a lot of money on it. Um, but, and, and I think, you know, in, in, as you were pointing out, there are circumstances where that happens and where it makes sense. And I agree with that. Um, but those are becoming more and more of the unicorn examples. Um, and, you know, 99% of a business isn't falling into that category. It, it makes more sense for them to, to pick up the, the get XYZ instead of XYZ.com or to pick up a .io instead of a .com or .co or something else. Um, and then just try to work on pushing that web page to uh, the top of, of Google. Hmm. Yeah. And and um, then we see it, yeah. And it's a very common thing. We see a lot of upgrades and it kind of works with that as well. Like if at some point you get to a point where you're large enough and big enough and it makes sense to invest in a better than the main name, then you know, then it makes sense. Yeah. And we do, that's right. Yeah. But that pool of companies is a is a smaller and smaller pool, and so that, that, you know, I think it can be tough to be if you're if you're holding a bunch of domain names. I think I think it can be tough because you're 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 waiting for that one whale to come by and really be interested in one of the things that you happen to be holding. Um, that that can be you know that can be tough, um, but it it certainly happens, and then it, it's just one of those situations that you know when it pays, you may hold a thousand domain names and pay you know hundreds or thousands of dollars more likely in registration fees a year but then you get that one and they pay seven hundred and fifty thousand for it and boom you know it was it was worth it or you, you hold them forever and if nobody ever buys them it's it's such a it's such a uh it's a risky proposition these days i I think um, it's, we mentioned it's like real estate, I guess it's very similar in many ways. It's effectively real estate on the internet, if you like. So yeah, it's a, it's a similar, I, I have that, that there's that it's dark behind me, but there's that apartment across the road that's like listed for sale for 10 million. And it's like the top floor and they have a jacuzzi and everything. It's really cool. Uh, and, and it's empty and it's not being used. But it's, you know, it's been there for like three years and it's listed for 10 million and it's, it, it's, I guess it's an investment. And that's, that's very much how I see um, the mains as well. Yeah, they're not uncommon. Yeah, I, I, that's a good analogy. I think that's right. Um, yeah. And it's a good point. I, I think, in fact, drilling deeper into that analogy, you're right. I mean, it look, it look, if it's a, you know, penthouse kind of apartment and it's got a jacuzzi and all sorts of, you know, bells and whistles, yeah, those types of things maybe are worth holding on to, right? Because sooner or later, a big company probably is going to want to buy that very, you know, or a wealthy person in this case to keep with the mm. analogy is going to, is going to want to invest in that that tenth store, that penthouse suite that's worth ten million dollars. Sooner or later, somebody is going to want that. Um, and that's that's the thing. With, I often say that to people as well. It's it really depends. Like I, I I'm going to admit I don't have ten million to to spend on it. But even if I did. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't spend it on that. It's just not the sort of a thing that makes sense for me, not the sort of a thing I like and not the sort of a like way, like I wouldn't know what to do with it. It's, it's just not, you know, if, if I was to buy it, I would have to, like, I don't like staying in one place for a long time. So I would have to think, okay, I need to buy it as an investment. How do I get my investment on that? How long is it going to take? It just doesn't make sense. But to somebody who has a way of either just enjoying it because they have it, or making more than 10 million with it, it makes sense. Oh, yep, that makes yeah, perfect sense to me. Um, yeah. So 
Yeah. <laughs> and on rebrands, re I wanted to ask you about something that everybody's talking about, like uh, Facebook's rebrand now. What what are your thoughts on that? Just because it's relevant and very timely. Yeah, actually, I don't want to get into uh, specific companies like that per se. Oh, okay. Just... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's totally okay. I was, yeah. Um, you know, just generally though, uh, thoughts about major rebrands. Um, it's it's always a risk, right? To to do that because you you've anytime you build up brand equity, you're jumping mm. into something that is a little less known. You may not know the problems that are associated with that other name. There may be other companies that come out of the woodwork that claim better rights to that name or that's confusingly similar to them. If it does cause consumer confusion in the marketplace, you're gonna have to deal with that. Uh, it could be expensive from you know, a legal perspective for, for you to, to do that. And then risky from a brand equity standpoint, because what if your consumers don't relate to the new brand in the same way that they did the other one? Mm. Um, so I, I think it is a, anytime you have a major rebrand, it's, it can be a risk. So I'll mm. just leave it. At, I'll just leave it at that, I guess. Yeah. Okay. That's very, I mean, a lot of people find, yeah, I've been talking about branding and rebranding with my last three guests, I think on, on this, but they were in the rebranding business. The, the last two guests, sorry. They, they were helping companies rebrand. And I was expecting from them, since it's their job, obviously, I was expecting to them to be like, oh, yeah, you should rebrand anytime, you know, go ahead. And it's a good thing and et cetera, et cetera. And actually, both of them had a similar advice more towards the risky part of it. So, yeah. 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 I, well, that's because there is, <laughs> that's because there is some, <laughs> some significant risk to doing that. Um, but, you know... You, you have to imagine that uh, all of that had been weighed and yeah I'm sure, sure you know you, <laughs> yeah. nobody makes that nobody makes that decision on a whim <laughs> yeah. kind, of, kind of thing so <laughs> well that <about> morning <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so that's it changing the company name <laughs> just, just didn't like it today <laughs> <laughs> cool oh dear all right last question I'm not it's not what time is it there by the way it, so for me, oh, yeah. it is one eighteen. Oh, okay. So it's not like it's just like it. Okay. Anyway, I'm not gonna hold you much longer. Um, I'm, sure. I I so like I see a lot of big names you've worked with, and you mentioned uh, you oftentimes work with big companies. What just to give an idea of our audience, what sort of a company, what sort of a size, or, or how do you like if somebody wants to work with you, what sort of a company is that? Yeah. Um, yes, you probably saw, you know, it's, uh, it ranges. So from very, very large to very, very small. So mm. uh, there's really no size that would, would be inappropriate. It would just be the, I guess the, the level of service that you would be looking for would, would be different. So maybe a larger company is going to be more interested in trademark maintenance and they have, you know, a thousand filings all over the world and they need help making sure that they get renewed correctly. And, you know, just strategy about how to enforce those brands against other parties and how to defend those brands when, when demand letters come in. Um, that's just a different type of discussion than a startup who, you know, I, I started, you know, I'm telling right now you need to be worried about not getting sued and you need to be thinking about where you're going to rank SEO wise. And you need to be thinking about, you know, what scope of rights could you get out of this trademark best case scenario two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. So mm -hmm. it's the size of the company, you know, there's, there's really no, I, I, I'm indifferent. And I work with very big companies. I work with startups. It's just a different type of product i guess that you know mm -hmm. you're getting it just i push you in different directions depending on on what size you are to, to what what suits your needs and is going to make sense for you to just to spend resources on like you know if you're a startup uh, obviously the best thing to do is always to clear a trademark brand and to uh, file trademark applications for your mark and the iterations of it and uh to you know aggressively enforce those and well not maybe not aggressively but to make sure you're, you're enforcing mm -hmm. them into uh, push those through to get registrations. But if you're a startup, you know, you don't have the budget for that. Maybe even though you have four different brands potentially that, you know, should be protected, maybe we're just going for the house mark. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and maybe instead of doing it everywhere, maybe we're just doing it in one or two countries. Um, so mm-hmm. long story short, yeah, it just depends on it's no, no wrong size for me, but, uh, you just, where I push where, where you should go does depend on the size. That's the only thing that really truly changes. Um, sure. yeah. And so I, you know, I left just a little bit about about that. I left a, a large international firm. I used to work for, for Cooley um, and did uh, the exact same thing that, that I do there. Uh, I do here now. Um, and I just sort of saw a, a market gap, I think. Um, you know, I felt that large firm rates were maybe a bit too too high for this this type of work and clients were sort of shying away from from doing the the types of things that maybe they, they ought to be doing in terms of of protecting their brand or for getting trademark applications, just, just cost is just too high. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of started this with the, the idea of, you know, doing trademarks, right. Basically, I want to make sure that we're doing all checking all the boxes that we're supposed to be checking. Not that we weren't doing it there, but it's just expensive to do it. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and being able to do it in a way that's not going to crush your budget. So um, that was kind of the, division and your, that's your colleagues that's, must, my, must must love you uh no i still talk to them it's okay uh uh still talk to them they're you know it's uh it, it's it, when you're when you're that size as, as, as they are you know i don't think that uh it even blipped the radar so, uh, um, cool. no i like well, that I, yeah well it was um it was good chatting with you. I'm glad that uh, we've been able to set this up and uh, happy that you had me on the podcast. Like I said, I, I love talking about trademarks and branding. It uh, really is a, a passion of mine. So mm. um, and it, it's, I can tell it's a passion of yours. I, I think I follow you on, on LinkedIn or somewhere else. Um, and uh, I see your post and I, you can just sort of tell that when somebody cares about the brands, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's... Yeah, and that's a that's a, a a side of of what I'm doing that obviously I'm I'm lacking expertise in. So it it's really interesting and very helpful. And I, I think a lot of people that work in that space as well don't like they they see that the the legal side of it more as a as just a limitation. Um, or you know, oh, we can't do that because uh, we have to check trademark and uh, let's just whatever or like you said it's too expensive and and all of those things kind of add up to eventually you're gonna have to pay for it anyway so yeah because you don't have a brand without the legals i mean Mm. you have to think what what you might be thinking you're holding this big bag of rights you might be thinking oh i have this brand and you really don't if you don't have the title to Mm. it you don't own it and so you know i the brand is only as good as what the law says it is. And so you've got to be able to enforce it. So I, yeah, I, I think the legal side is just a, a tremendously important part of it. And, and unfortunately it can be frustrating for a lot of, you know, a lot of business owners because they think they're holding something that they're not. And hmm. I know a lot of, a lot of them pass up on the legal side of it thinking like, Oh, just as you described, it's sort of like this nuisance and I don't want to deal with it. But hmm. at the end of the day, you don't have a brand if you don't have it, le- <laughs> if you don't have it legally, hmm. you don't have it. <laughs> yeah you know what yeah. i mean um so you've it's it's, it's got to be careful with it um 